Welcome to the SelfGrowth.com show. My name is David Ricklin, and I'm the founder of SelfGrowth.com. Today, we'll be discussing self-care for caregivers, a mindful approach. If you're currently a caregiver, you're going to want to listen in very, very closely today. To help us understand this topic, I'm excited to interview Janet Fouts. Make sure you have something to write with. We have a lot of information we're going to share today. Before we get started, I want to just take a couple of minutes and share some information about Janet. Uh, Janet is an accomplished entrepreneur, public speaker, author, facilitator, and coach. She works with companies and individuals to be better communicators with compassion, respect, and confidence. Her special focus is working with family caregivers to help them take care of themselves and be better able to handle the challenges of caregiving. And we know there's a lot of those. Janet, welcome to today's program. Thank you so much, David. I'm really glad to be here. All right, very excited. I jump right in over here. How did you find yourself an expert on caregiving and the importance of self-care? Can you give us a little background on that? Well, you know, it came totally out of left field for me. Um, I was not prepared to be a caregiver as most people are not. And my partner developed breast cancer and we were suddenly thrown into learning the medical system and how to make everything work, how to be a caregiver, how to be able to be a caregiver and take care of myself, which I did not. And I really spiraled down into some pretty nasty places. And one day I realized that, okay, I'm a caregiver, but I'm not giving the best care that I can because I'm not taking care of myself. I'm exhausted, I'm distracted, sure. all of those things. And so I really um, decided I needed to start taking care of myself. I met a lot of other caregivers as well and started to hear from them. All right, all well, makes sense. A real life experience kind of jolts us a lot of times and we realize what we're doing to ourselves and it, it forces us really to face things we wouldn't necessarily face. So that's, I, I completely get that. And I, I know you started studying kind of mindfulness and uh, emotional intelligence at roughly the same time, how did that change things? Well, you know, I found that I was really in a pit. I went to doctors, I did the therapy thing, I did the drugs thing, I did all kinds of things and they weren't working. Right. And so one day I found a retreat for mindfulness-based stress reduction. And when I took that retreat and took those two days, my mind just blew. Oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is how we take care of ourselves. And that really became a journey of educating myself in not only how to care for myself, but also to help others care for themselves, because I am sure not alone in this one. Now, there's a lot of people that are facing the same challenges that, that you are facing. And I've studied mindfulness, and I can definitely, from personal experience, get the impact it can have on who we are and, and and our physical impact on us physically and emotionally, psychologically, it can have great impact. So I want to jump in. You know, the topic is kind of self-care for caregivers. Uh, and we know that people who are caregivers have difficulty really taking care of themselves first. This is a very common thing. A lot of people are faced with this challenge. And I know you've learned a tremendous uh, amount. And we're going to get into some detail on some of the things you're doing. What I'd like to do is start with getting some tips. So you've learned a lot along the way. First, by helping yourself, and then I know you've been working with people, with a lot of other people over the, over the years. So mm -hmm. can you give us some of the top tips that you have for people that are caregivers in a similar situation that you were in? Sure, absolutely. So, you know, the first thing that I hear from caregivers when I talk to them is, I don't have time. And that's not sure. actually true, because spending two hours trying to numb yourself enough to be able to go to sleep watching Netflix is not helping you but it's something that we all do. We go into all these maladaptive behaviors, we drink, we use drugs, we do all kinds of things to try to numb ourselves. And that's actually deadening us. It's deadening us and making us not good caregivers. Mm -hmm. And it's also not making anything better. It's not gonna resolve anything. So that's my absolute first tip is start looking at how you spend your time. What do you do that maybe you could change and what would you do differently if you had an option? Um, sometimes we get locked up into, I'm a caregiver now, I can have no life. That's not true either. Even for those of us who are caring for people 24 seven, there's still times, for example, in the emergency room, meditating, 
you're going to spend hours there. If you're going to sit with somebody who's getting a PET scan, that's an hour and a half. Sure. Read a book, listen to music, meditate. Mm -hmm. Take time for yourself. All right. Uh, what's interesting about that, and I want to delve a little bit deeper into it, really reevaluate it. And I think that's something that's important for every change in your life. You really need to look at and evaluate kind of where you are and what you're doing. And I, I know one of the challenges for people is they feel guilty if they're not doing the caregiving part. And they're mm -hmm. like, well, should I be out, whatever it is, meditating? Should I run? Should I do this? And there's a, a guilt that people feel that they're not focused on the, the priority in their minds. The priority is being the caregiver. Mm -hmm. How do you suggest people handle that? Well, I have two things to say about that. The first one is when you really ask the person that you're caring for, who you probably have a great deal of love for, would they want you to feel that way? Sometimes, yeah, they want you to feel guilty for not taking care of them. But when you really get down to it, is that what they would want you to feel? Mm -hmm. Not so. But we get so wrapped up in it and we're so in our own heads that when we can figure out how to get out of our heads, then we can learn a little bit, we can get a little distance, and we can allow ourselves to be kind to ourselves and to have self-compassion. All right, well, that's actually a very important thing. And we teach the importance of being compassionate and being sensitive to others. Mm -hmm. But I find it sounds like you're the same way, that it's, it's also, it's critical to start with yourself. If you're gonna be compassionate, you need to be compassionate to yourself first. Yeah. And it's the hardest, the hardest compassion is for ourselves, for most people. It's easy to be compassionate for someone else. And that's why we're caregivers. It's our nature, but we also have to find that compassion for ourselves or we're not going to do a good job. I see the same thing in, in terms of compassion as a, another area that we teach is the importance of forgiving people. <laughs> and I find that people, especially people in this situation have difficulty forgiving themselves or that they're overwhelmed, they didn't do as much as they should have, whatever it is. How do you suggest people cope with that concept? That they're just difficulty forgiving themselves and they're always beating themselves up. You know, it's, it's really common to beat ourselves up. And, and the thing is, is that what we need to do is recognize when we're doing that because we can't change that behavior until we can recognize, oh, that was a trigger oh, I'm doing it again. And when we can recognize that, that's the first step to being mm -hmm. able to stop it, to being able to go, okay, I see what I'm doing now and I can make a change, but we have to recognize it first. Any suggestions for how people can go about recognizing or, or literally they have to kind of stop themselves, I would imagine. Yeah. Any suggestions? And, and this is both for the compassion and the forgiveness for all that. How do you go about kind of you're overwhelmed. You're just doing, doing. How do you stop yourself in order to be able to do some of these things? You know, what really helps me a lot is sitting. Sometimes I'll sit with someone and go, okay, let's walk through what's going on here. But the other thing that really works if you're on your own is to sit down and start journaling and creating a journal over, okay, what are my emotional triggers? What are the things that I need to change about myself? And once you can start writing those down, you can start thinking, okay, if I didn't have this, what would life be like? And how would it be better? And when you start walking down that path, right. you can start to see the end of the path is looking pretty darn good. And it's really that process of walking through that that can be just hugely helpful. And we don't take the time to do that. And again, you can do that while you're waiting because we spend a lot of time waiting. There's absolutely a lot of time waiting, depending on what's going on with the person, there's hospital visits, there's doctor visits, there's a lot of things, and you're, you're not sitting in the room with them all the time. So there's this time that you have available for these things. In terms of physical, let's talk a little bit about kind of physical health. Do you have any suggestions for people relative to their physical health, the things they should be doing, kind of mm -hmm. any specific things to, to take care of themselves? And, and one of the things I want to point out as well, uh, in terms of the caregiver world. So I helped my, uh, my parents have both passed away and I have an older sister who's the primary who's kind of closer to where my parents had lived. And I was kind of back up. I was the, the next one in terms of 
proximity. So I saw some of this. I saw a lot of what my older sister was going through, and I, I saw some of it for me. But it's it's very difficult to kind of refocus uh, for a lot of folks on, on what's going on. And, and I, I want to talk a little bit about kind of two areas. If you have some specific tech, uh some specific tips for physical health, and then we'll get into some more tips for some mental health. And then I want to get into more of what you're doing. So sure. any s specific tips to, in terms of your physical health, things you should be focused on? You know, getting up and moving. Uh, one of the things that happens to our bodies physically when we're under stress is we build up a lot of cortisol in our system. And if we just sit in the same place with cortisol, mm -hmm. it'll last longer but physical exercise has been shown to dissipate cortisol. So one of the things that I do when I'm stuck in a hospital, for example, I get up and I walk the corridors. And as I walk down the halls and I see all the rest of these people, I realize that we all have something in common, that we're all here together. And I start to send them loving kindness. I will pass someone in the hall and say, maybe you be, may you be happy, may you be well. Mm -hmm that's good for my heart right. and the physical exercise reduces the cortisol. And so the two of them together are incredibly powerful. If you can't get up and walk around, you can do very simple stretches, mm -hmm. you can do breathing practice. There's a lot of breath work that you can do that can significantly t make an impact. Uh, and the last tip in that area that I think is really important is take a breath. We don't do that when we're tense. Our breathing rate is just insane. But if we can stop, take one breath, it can change the world just in that one breath. All right. I like all those ideas. So I like the walking. I'm all on board with movement. It's critical. And that's critical for everybody, regardless. We need to move where we become a sedentary culture. So you're, you're there. You mentioned you're in a waiting room. We sit for an hour and a half on our phones. We're just living on our phones and sitting. You need to need to get up and physically move. Stretching, huge proponent of stretching. I, you know, I can't understate the value of it. Particularly, I'm, I'm a person whose back tends to bother, and I think a lot of people put their stress into their back. Yeah. And the stress they have going on, and stretching is a, a perfect thing. And then breathing. You know, people forget. And what I like about this concept of breathing, and you mentioned a little bit earlier, is it forces us to stop. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going, we're going, we're going, and just taking, even if it's periodically deep breath, it kind of forces us to stop. And these are, these are things that kind of impact us physically, but they also work a little bit on the emotional level in terms of who we are. A any other suggestions relative to our emotional well-being? Things that, so journalism, journaling, absolutely valuable. I've, I've done it myself and I see the value. Any other things on the emotional side? Any kind of quick tips? Something that I hear from caregivers quite often is that I don't have any joy anymore. I'm just constantly at this level and that is all I can do. Right. And we stop recognizing things around us. Mm -hmm. And if we can just stop and look out a window at the sun, at a tree, at a flower, at a child, at a puppy, at the person that we love, and really, instead of just going, oh, look, it's a puppy, look at the puppy right. and really absorb that and give yourself a moment to right. absorb that and store it up. And as you do that over time, you can find those little moments of happiness that when you really, 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 really need it, it's going to be there for you, but we have to build it up like a bank. It makes sense. It's interesting. The phrase that you use is one I've heard before. They've, their joy is gone. They've lost joy. They're, they're so deep involved in the challenges of what they're doing right now when overwhelmed, they forget that you need to have some joy in your life. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you're not getting it and it's there, it's around. And I'm, for me, one of the things I like to do is that if I'm just walking, just giving someone a smile, they smile back at you or good morning, or, you know, you, you find that you, you send stuff out. You just, and you might have to force it at first, but when you force it, it comes back and kind of reinforces it. And, and um, that's key. If, if you have to force it, even if you have to force it, if you smile, mm -hmm. your body responds to that physical physicality yep. with a little bit of happiness. Right. So just... All right. A lot of great tips on both the physical side and the, and the mental health side over here. 
I want to delve a little bit deeper into some of the other things you've been working on. I know you wrote a book called, I think it's When Life Hits the Fan. Is mm -hmm. that the title? Yep. Tell us, tell us a little bit about it. Why did you write that book? You know, as I really dove into mindfulness and really started to see how healing it was and how good it was for me, and I started talking to other caregivers and I interviewed them for the book as well and really took their circumstances and created tools for them to use to solve those issues and to really be able to work through it. And, and my goal with the book literally is just to help as many people as I can get through this because it's not easy. And we're all going to have to go through it or we're going to know someone going through it. Right. And the two things on that, I love the title, When Life Hits the Fan, because this has happened to a lot of us. Yeah. And sometimes you get stuck, you're like a deer in headlights, you don't know what to do. Sometimes depression, situational depression hits, there's so many things. So I, I, I love the concept because I think everybody throughout their life has a point where life just hits the fan, yep. whether it's physical, emotional, mental financial, you know, life just hits the fan. So I, I kind of love that concept. And I, I think we all need help when life hits the fan and practical ideas and knowledge and wisdom is always a, a great way to approach it. And I know you've gotten some feedback, but what kind of feedback have you gotten since the book came out? And I think it came out about a year ago. Yeah, it came out about a year ago. And, you know, I've had a lot of caregivers say that it's been helpful to them. And I've been teaching at some like a cancer care clinic, for example, and just working with caregivers and they find that it really resonates with them. But what really just warms my heart so much is to hear that people have put these things into use and that it's actually worked for them. Mm -hmm. and, you know, to hear that someone is going through a very difficult time and that something that I did has helped them is why I do what I do. I like it. And for people who want more information about what you do, and we're going to go a little bit more depth, some other things, but who want to just jump in right now, can you share your website to get more information about some of the things that you're doing? Sure. They can find me at nearlymindful.com and also janetfouts.com. Okay. That's nearlymindful.com and Janet Fouts, and Fouts is F-O-U-T-S.com. Yes. All right. Sounds good. So let's delve a little bit deeper. So valuable book, a lot of practical things. It's great that you're getting good feedback. Who do you find? You, you work with a lot of caregivers. Who are your best clients? Who, who gets the most benefit? My best clients are people who really have realized, as I did, that they need to do something different, that they need to make a change, and that they're ready to take a stab at it, to make a change. And, you know, we all reach that point and sometimes it's total desperation and sometimes it's just, wow, I have got to do something different here. Right. And that's when people are ready to really try these, these strategies and that's these tools. All right. That's important because what I find if people aren't ready, they're not going to do anything. No, they're not going to do anything. You know, it's as much value and as much knowledge as you've, really developed over the years by working with people, uh, people need to be ready. They need to be at a point where like, oh, you're right. I'm in overwhelm. I know I need help. Mm -hmm. I know it's time. I, I can't continue like this. Something needs to change. And I know one of the things you do is you lead retreats yes. and you have one coming up. Uh, tell me a little bit about the retreats and kind of what's the best part of retreats? Why do you like retreats and what are, what do the retreats look like? I got my introduction to this at a retreat and it really was amazing. And what I, the feedback I've been getting from people who've been to my retreats is that it's a real catalyst for change. And some of it's really that, you know, when you spend really focused time and you don't have anything else to distract you, you don't have to be off somewhere. You're not worried about all those other things. You can really focus and absorb the material and put it into practice, which is absolutely crucial because you know what, okay, self-help books, videos, CDs, we watch that stuff, but we don't put it into practice because there's mm -hmm. nobody holding our hand. Right. And that's what retreats are amazing for. And, you know, this one I've got coming up in November is in the Redwoods around Santa Cruz. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. And it's going to be really, really restorative and give people a way to reboot a little bit. What I find valuable is just getting away also, because when we're 
a caregiver when you're in the moment it's hard you know you might break loose for 50 minutes an hour but to really break loose and make changes the more time you have to kind of separate yourself and and kind of build you're mentioning your people you, you need to build some new skills and some new habits mm-hmm. and you don't build a new habit in 15 minutes you know it takes repetition you need to first learn it understand it incorporate it and do it yeah and it sounds like a retreat when I find then when I'm away from what I'm typically doing, that's the best way for me to really focus on it. Because in the world, I talk about all the distractions. You know, the, we live in a world of distractions. So it provides the ability to kind of remove those distractions. That's one of the reasons I, I like the concept. Yeah, they're, they're, they're amazing. All right. Now, workshops, online, offline, what do you do in that area? I do both online and offline workshops. I'm doing some in corporations, some for nonprofits, as I said, for, you know, the cancer care centers, Uh um, places where caregivers are, but I'm also doing them for executives because, you know, the stress that we build up in day to day, I worked in tech for 20 years and I worked in restaurants for 20 years. So both of those are very high stress businesses and they really need a little bit of mindfulness to settle in and, and do be happier in their lives and, and not think that there is life work balance because there doesn't really have to be. You can right. actually be you at both places. Okay. Now, one of the things I hear from people all the time relative to self-care, especially when there's a situation like this is I don't have, I got too much on my plate. I don't have the time to take care of myself. You know, I, I hear this constantly from people. I don't have the time, whatever it is, to eat right, to exercise, whatever the self-care is. What do you tell those people? You do have the time. You just need to look at how you're spending your time right now. You know, when we talked earlier about the Netflix thing or all of the things we do to distract ourselves from the pain that we're in, mm-hmm. we can be doing much more profitable things with that time. Okay. Now, can you take a couple more minutes and share some more information? So let's give out the website one more time. So what are the websites best way to find out about? And that you have all the information on your retreats on the website as well, the workshops, your book, everything's on there. So when, can you share the, the two websites again? Yeah, nearlymindful.com and janetfouts.com. All right. Both of those sites have a lot of information. It's very diverse information too, because some of it's, from technical world. So that's fun too. (laughs) All right. So make sure you go to her website, check out some of the things. And if they want to contact you, can they contact you directly through the website as well? All your information to email me at Janet at JanetFouts.com or give me a call 415-990-3991. I have no problem with people just picking up the phone and calling me. If I don't answer it, I'm busy. Okay. (laughs) Sounds good. So website, email, They have the two websites. They can email you. They can call you. Sounds good. I want to just about wrap up. There's a lot of good information you shared today. Do you have any final words for our listeners today that have taken the time to to listen to what you've been doing? Final words for people. I think if I could teach anyone anything, it would be stop, take a breath, and then go forward from there because that pause and that breath Sure. allows you to be much better at communicating at getting your job done, especially when you're dealing with a crisis situation. One breath is all it takes to just get centered, to get sure. focused. And that is the most powerful thing that you can do for yourself. And it doesn't take time. I like it. It takes a couple of seconds. Just stop. And it's something that we frequently forget to do, which is why we're just running. Mm-hmm. Um, Janet, I want to thank you. This is very, very valuable. I want to thank you for coming here today. I want to urge folks, check out our website. If you need the break, which I I know many of us do, check out her retreats, check out her online workshops, check out her books. And Janet, once again, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, David. You're welcome. I want to thank all our listeners for listening. And I want to wish everybody great success in all the areas of your lives. We'll talk to everybody soon. Bye, everybody.